I made the prettiest dress in the ugliest color. Hello there and welcome or welcome back to the June Made channel. My name is Paula Jean and today I am talking about the Flora Tank and Dress by Pattern Scout. This is Casey's newest pattern and I was super, super excited for this for a long time. She had made one for herself, obviously, before she decided to turn this into a pattern. And uh, I'm, I'm just really glad that she decided to turn it into a pattern. And so I'm gonna tell you about some of the things that I really like about it, some of the things that I changed in my rendition, and also what I am about to do to this dress. Uh, that I worked so hard on. <laughs> so anyway, first the pattern, it's a very simple sundress. It's got a choice of straps. You can do a spaghetti strap or a wider strap that is more conducive to wearing a bra with. It comes in a top or a shorter length dress or a longer length dress. In the longer length, the dress has side slits at the bottom and both versions of the dress have pockets which we all love, or at least I love. And then the shaping across the upper part of the bodice is made by a series of wide tucks that are just so elegant and simple and uh, but make such a nice impact and, and make it you know more than just like a straight up and down dress. So I made mine out of a linen duvet cover. It came to me through a friend who thought I might be able to use it in some way in my sewing stuff. She was getting rid of it. And uh, mostly I've been using it for muslins. And it was huge. It was, it was like a California king size duvet cover. And it gave me so much fabric. And I did make my muslin of this dress out of this fabric. And when I was deciding on what I was gonna use for my final fabric, I really liked the idea of having this dress in linen and the only other linen that I had enough yardage of was some white linen that I am saving actually for a two-piece set. I wanna make a pair of uh, pants and a vest out of that. So I didn't wanna use that. And I was like, well, maybe I should just use this duvet cover because I've got plenty. And the only problem is it's this color. And to say that this does not suit my skin tone is maybe the understatement of the year where color and my skin tone is considered. So I've been wanting to kind of take a little bit more risk with my, with my sewing and, and kind of incorporate some other things into it, um, you know, like fabric manipulation and, you know, maybe some painting or printing or something like that. I am very late in getting onto the dye wagon. Uh, it became, it was very, very popular in the sewing community. Um, I kind of started noticing like last year, but I, for some reason, haven't, I just haven't dove in. So I decided that maybe this is the project to do that with. And I had been considering how I was gonna approach that because I didn't wanna dye a whole length of fabric. I, I just felt like that was beyond my capabilities and my home resources. I had been thinking about like, well, what if I sewed up a garment in a thread color that was in the same family as what I was going to probably dye it. And I say this because I, I was gonna be dyeing a natural fiber, which is the linen, uh, but the thread is polyester, so the thread won't pick up the dye. And then I saw Obsesso on Instagram, and if you don't already follow him, oh, Wow, like his work is so impeccable. He makes clothing for himself. Occasionally he makes dresses for family members and, and he self-drafts things and his work is just so stunning. And a couple of weeks ago, he had done exactly that. He had made this beautiful white dress, stitched it with this bright kind of um, persimony orange thread and then he dyed the dress. and especially after seeing how well that turned out and what I had been thinking of, I was like, okay, time for me to try this. So that's what I am gonna try with this. The color that I'm going for is, I saw it on a car. <laughs> I, I actually tend to really love car colors because they often have so many different tones going in them. You're like, is that a gray, blue, green? Uh, mm. I love anything that doesn't fit into a box 
welcome to my psyche, uh, especially where color is concerned. I like undefinable colors. So I had seen this color on a car that was this deep brown plum little flecks of like amber in it and I just really, really loved it. And so what I got is these two colors. So I, I'm just starting with RIT dye. Uh, I would like to experiment with some fiber reactive dyes at some point, but I'm just kind of starting out on the bottom rung here. So I got eggplant and dark brown, and while I am not an expert in color theory by any stretch of the imagination, I do know enough about it to know that I probably should have picked up like a wine color or something in a deep red to add to this mix to kind of get that exact color that I was going for. But I just decided to, to go with this and see where it got me. Now I did take a couple of drops of each of these and put them in some boiling water and threw them in with a sample of the fabric and I came up with this. So it's definitely more on the purple side, but I do feel like the brown kind of tempered it a little bit. And if this is what turns out in the whole dress, I will be thrilled. I ended up stitching it with a dark brown thread because I thought I was going to go more toward a brown color, but um, I actually stitched a little a little line here with that brown thread and it, it blends in just fine. So even if this is what I end up with, I will be thrilled. The reason that I am a little bit nervous is because even though I had washed this duvet twice before I ever took it apart to use it as yardage, I still don't know if there might be some things in it that I can't see on this nothing color. <laughs> like there may be some spots that got some oil on it or something that I just can't see and maybe it won't take the dye and maybe this whole dress will be ruined. I don't know, but like I said, I do want to take more risks with my sewing projects and so I figured this is a good one for that. So I'm going to show you a few changes that I made to, uh, not to the pattern, but um, just to the way that I constructed it uh, on this ugly grayish version, um, just mainly because I did do dark stitching and so it's just going to be easier to see. So starting at the top, the first thing that I did was I made a facing. The original instructions um, call for the top edge of the, of the neckline all around to be finished with bias binding. Now I love bias binding. I love making bias binding. And it's a great way to finish this dress. I did, however, have an idea in my head for how I might want to change the neckline a little bit. And to do that change, if I was going to do it, would require a facing. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna make a facing and if I change the neckline, great. And if I don't, it still works. So that was the first thing I did was, um, was making a facing for the top instead of using bias binding. The next thing that I did was I ended up extending the tucks four inches in both the front and the back. When I made my muslin, I really liked how it fit around the bust line and I just kind of wanted it to be a little bit more fitted a little further down, like closer to my waist and that accomplished that great. It's still loose enough that I can put it on without a zipper and yeah, I think it just kind of follows my shape a little bit, uh, a little bit better. So I did that. And then the only other thing that I changed was how I finished the side slits. Uh, so in the instructions, the seams are done with French seams. Uh, if you want, you can do them with regular, regular seams as well, but I did French seams. And so instead of just folding back that seam allowance to form the slit, I used bias binding to actually finish the inside edge of the slit so I end up with a couple of uh, like wider stitch lines along the slit like that. I hope you can see that anyway. Uh, so yeah those are the only changes that I made. I love the fit of it and this style which to me kind of has a little bit of a nod to 20s silhouettes. I think this would make a beautiful a simple wedding dress for somebody. I think if you if you stopped the pleats also at the at the point where they stop on the pattern and there's there's enough room in the in the rest of the dress that like if you 
uh, needed a special occasion dress and you are pregnant and, and showing in, in any way and need some space for, for your belly, uh, I think this might be a pattern to consider. I also had a bunch of ideas as I was cutting out the pattern as I was making my muslin. So I'm actually gonna grab the sample and show you actually what I thought I might do to the neckline. I didn't end up doing it because I really liked it as is, but I may do it on a future version of this dress. So I will grab that and show you what I'm talking about. All right, so let me start with the reason that I made the facing. So I thought that in case this straight across neckline wasn't going to look the best on me, I thought it might be cool to put like a little notch in the center just to kind of break up the line and, and add a little bit of interest in the center front. So as it happened, I really liked the neckline as it was, so I left it as it was, but this is an option if you are thinking like, oh, I can't wear that neckline, but that dress looks really cool. This is a way that you might be able to incorporate it. So how I was able to do this notch was to make the facing, stitch the facing on right sides together after I had done all of my tucks, after I had done the bust dart, uh, and after I had sewn the front and the back together. After I had done that, I just drew a line on the center front, determined what angle I wanted my little notch to be and marked that on the fabric. And then after sewing that, I cut down right to the stitching at the point, but not through it, trimmed away the seam allowance and turned it over. And I ended up with this. So, and it does look pretty cool. And I may do this in a, in a future version. I made my facing by folding up the pattern pieces and folding out the dart and drawing it on a piece of paper. But there is actually a little bit simpler way to do that uh, by reprinting just a couple of the pattern pieces. And I'll show you that a little later in the video. So some other ideas I had for embellishment because these tucks are such a great opportunity. They're, they're beautiful on their own, but they're also a great opportunity to add some embellishment on on a dress in any way really that you like. So one of the things that I tried here was a ruffle. So this is just a single layer of fabric that I finished with a rolled hem and I gathered it and I, I went ahead and kind of folded the pleat over uh, like this, inserted the inserted the ruffle and then stitched along the outside. So that is top stitch, but you could totally do it as the original instructions are written and just sandwich that ruffle in there and stitch it down. The other thing that you can do is uh, some hand embroidery. I am by no means uh, an embroiderer, but I kind of try my hand at it every, <laughs> every once in a while. So this is just a little example of some hand embroidery that you can do. Or if your machine has some, some cool stitches that you like, you can actually do um, just a simple machine embroidery uh, as well. And you can do it in a contrasting color or a couple of contrasting colors. It's, I think that can look really pretty too. And the reason it lends itself to this is because those tucks that are behind there, um, they give you that extra, those extra layers of fabric that make it robust enough that it can handle some embellishment. So, so you end up with three layers of fabric because you have the top layer of fabric and then the two sides of the tuck. And so you end up with three layers of fabric that you can stitch any number of things through. The other thing I thought would be really neat is to actually press those creases because so in the original version, the pleats come down to uh, about here. This is probably a little bit further than, than what they normally come down to because I had lengthened mine. But, um, but then you have this, these free, free pleats down here. And I thought, well, if you, if you press down the whole length of the top or dress, whichever version you're making, and if that were top stitched all the way down, it makes this sort of linear columnar type of garment. And I thought if each of the pleats was done like that, 
that that could look really cool. How I did this one was I actually stitched below the pleat uh, where it attaches. I stitched the bottom part of that first, left some long thread tails here, and then I stitched down the pleat here, met up here exactly, landing my needle exactly at that point, and then pulled all the, all the threads, threads through, pulled all the threads through to the other side and knotted them. And that's how you get that long line where this is attached, but this is free. I also, on the underside, uh, like the folded part of that tuck, stitched that down. So you still get the, the freedom of movement and the ease through the hips. It's just a little bit more, um, a little bit more architectural, I guess. And what I thought would be really gorgeous, and I did not take the time to do it on this sample, but imagine a line of beautiful bugle beads, um, like crystal beads, all the way down this line that follows all the way down to the ground if you make this a floor length dress. I just think that that would be stunning, just a line of really pretty simple beads that are all the way down all the pleats and like I said you still have the ease so you it would shimmer with the movement like below the bust line uh, I think that would be really really stunning so so those are just a couple of the ideas that struck me as I was making this pattern um, another way actually I almost forgot another way to make the ruffles if you have a serger and uh, you follow the instructions in whatever uh, for whatever surgery you have, you can do either a rolled hem or a really, really tight, narrow serger stitch along a strip of fabric. You can gather that up and you can also use that as your ruffle. Um, and then that gives you the opportunity to also do a contrast color if you wanted to. You And you could also do um, like a like a gathered lace trim or or anything like that. I didn't have any in my stash, so I didn't do that. But that could also be really pretty as well. So those are, like I said, a few of the ideas that I had. So you can take it all the way from like cottage core up to an elegant, columnar, beautiful, architectural, fancy dress if you want to. So with that, let me show you that easier way to make a facing. And then I think I have to bite the bullet and just dye this damn dress. So in case you don't already know how to make a facing, the general rule that I've always followed anyway is to fold out any tucks, pleats, darts, anything like that. And basically you take the neckline or what waistline or whatever you're making a facing for, you draw the top of edge of it uh, onto another piece of paper and then you measure down however long you, however wide you want your facing to be. And then you follow that to cut that out and make that your face, facing piece. If you don't wanna do all of that, here is an option. So this is the top part of the front bodice for the Flora tank and dress. And uh, this is just three pages. So it's on the D cup option. It is pages three, four, and five. And what I've done is I've taken the uh, drawn straight lines down to, uh, down to the bottom here where all of the tucks are. Hopefully that shows up those green lines. And then I've got my bust dart here and, and this is gonna become really important here. So if you don't like the bulk of folding up each of the pleats, you can just cut along every other one. So you don't wanna cut every single one. And then bring that over to the next line and glue that down and do that for each of the pleats to take out the pleats. So now you've got the pleats taken care of. It is very important to also fold out the bust dart. You may be thinking like, oh, well, but the neckline is just along here. I don't need to worry about that. I'll just make my facing here. 
but folding out the bust dart does change the line of the neckline and it does make a difference if you don't. Um, trust me, uh, if you want to do your own experiment, you can, but uh, I will just let you know that I have already done that and it ended up wrong. <laughs> so then I will, from here, I will fold out this bust dart. I'm going to close that with some glue. And then from here, I made my facing two and a quarter inches long. Um, you can you can make it any pretty much any length that you want, but two and a quarter worked for me. Um, and as you probably saw when I was showing you, I just finished mine. I interfaced it, and I also finished it with a surged edge. If you wanted to uh, do some other kind of finishing, like turn up turn it up a quarter of an inch or anything like that, you may want to make that a little bit longer. But two and a quarter inches worked for me. Um, oh, and I forgot a pen. Okay. So along this top edge here, I'm going to mark two and a quarter inches at various points along the way, all the way around. And then if you want to, you can use a, uh, you can use a curve. I usually just hand draw mine in between the the little dashes here I don't get too ceremonious about it and then you cut that out and there you have and if you want to you can go ahead and and pull off this fold here. But you can see that that had gone into the bust dart and that, um, that curvature does work itself into the neckline and that's why it's so important to make sure that you have folded out that bust dart before you do this. So, uh, so this is the most complex part of it here is on the front, especially if you're using um, one of the larger cup sizes. Uh, and in the back it's the same process but it's basically just straight across. You really just have to either fold out or cut out the pleats. And so now you have your facing piece and you can make your, uh, make your markings on it and make sure that you put this on the fold. Remember too that because the original pattern calls for bias binding along the top, and I think it calls for half inch bias binding, that means that that seam allowance is effectively only a quarter of an inch. So um, make sure that you put, when you're putting your seam allowance, make a little reminder for yourself that this is a quarter inch seam allowance along the top. And then from there, all of the instructions are the same. So, uh, so hopefully that uh, helped you a little bit and uh, maybe made you want to try making a facing. All right, now I am done procrastinating. Now I'm gonna go dye the dress. All right, I think it's pretty safe to say that I have officially caught the dyeing bug. I am really happy with how this turned out. The color is actually even deeper and richer and closer to that original Inspiration car color than my little sample was, so I'm very happy with that. There are a couple of places, I don't even know if you can see it on the camera, but um, like on the straps where even though I was stirring the pot for the whole half hour, uh, those little straps got folded over so there's a little kind of more faded spot but I'm overall really happy with this. I did decide to do a tiny bit of embellishment. I used two embroidery floss colors, one sort of a uh, kind of a muted peach and the other one's a cocoa brown and I just did 
little pick stitches, same stitch that you would use if you were like hand stitching in an invisible zipper or something. And I just put them um, a little bit down the front and I put them in the back. And I also put them on the little uh, bow uh, detail. I just folded up the strap of the, of the bow and then put that around it. So it's a permanent bow, but not one that gets all like kind of up in your ears and floppy um, and I think it looks really nice. So with that, thank you so much for joining me on this uh, dyeing my flora dress journey. I'm so happy that uh, I get to fold another new thing into my making journey. So I appreciate everybody who has been watching my videos and especially this one's a little bit longer. So if you've stuck around to the end, thank you so much. If you are not subscribed yet, please consider subscribing. I think as I understand it, it helps to push my channel out in the algorithm and put it in people's feeds and I would love to grow this channel. So I would appreciate that if you would be so kind. Best wishes for a wonderful August and I will see you next time.